Hi everyone and welcome to this month's Office Hours hosted by the Rebus community and the Open Textbook Network. Um, my name is Zoe and I'm the Product and Project Manager at the Rebus community. Uh, we are working to develop a collaborative model for open textbook publishing and we also work to uh, join with our community to explore different topics uh, impacting on people working with open textbooks and this office hours event is one of the ways that we do that. Um, we're really pleased to partner with the open textbook network on this. The open textbook network is a community working to improve education through open education. Our members now represent about 15% of higher education institutions in the United States. And collectively, the more than 600 institutions in the Open Textbook Network have now saved students more than $8.5 million by implementing open education engagement and training programs that leverage open educational resources. And this month, we are talking about international perspectives on open textbooks and OER. We chose this topic this month because we work a lot in the North American context, but we know that there's amazing work happening with open textbooks around the world. And we really wanted to bring in some, some voices we hadn't heard from before uh, and understand the different contexts people work, with, work in, what the challenges are and, and how we can work with them as well. Uh, at Rebus, what we do, what we're building, we hope will be useful for everyone around the world. Um, so we're excited to hear from our guests today about what they get up to. Um, so our guests will introduce themselves, so I'll let them do the bulk of the talking. Uh, but I would also invite you to join us on our forum uh, all throughout this week, where our guests will be joining us to discuss the topics that come up during this session and uh, answer any questions that you might have and also it'll be a place for you to share your experiences if you are working with open textbooks around the world. We really look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Tomo. I'm doing a PhD at Carnegie Mellon University and I'm also a member of Creative Commons Japan. Um, today I'd like to talk about uh, three things. The status of open textbooks in Japan, um, the challenges that we are facing, and whether we feel that we are part of this global community of open education. So first of all, open textbooks in Japan. Uh, this is a very interesting question for us because we don't usually use the word open textbooks in Japan. And that is partly because um, the textbook price is um, a, not a serious issue in Japan. Um, I mean, compared to other countries like United States or Canada. And so students do not usually suffer from on the high prices of the college textbooks. But that doesn't mean that we are not interested in OER or other kinds of open education movement. And Japan was actually one of the first countries um, to join the movement of open courseware um, more than 10 years ago. And mostly higher education institutions in Japan have been uh, very actively involved in this, uh, in this movement. And we now have a lot of courses, both in Japanese and English. And I think one of the uh, unique aspects of open education movement in Japan is that we are seeing um, OER as something that will improve teaching and learning, um, rather than something that will reduce the cost of higher education. For example, um, there is a university called Hokkaido University, uh, which is one of the, um, the largest national universities in Japan. And the Hokkaido University has a center called Center for Open Education, where I worked before. And Center for Open Education, uh, their job is to uh, basically is to support faculty and the students uh, in their effort to create and use open educational resources. And we also share those materials with other uh, six other universities in the Hokkaido area. And we have been very successful. Um, so we create uh, more than 500 uh, OER modules per year. And, um, there are more and more faculty and students who are interested in this idea of open education and who are interested in co-creating uh, OER materials with us and using those materials for their teaching and learning. But we are still facing some in, uh, important challenges um, in OER movement in Japan. The, one of the biggest challenges that I see is um, the lack of understanding around the, the, the how to use OER. Um, in teaching and learning. You know, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of courses available, both in Japanese and English, but we don't really know how um, users use those materials for their teaching, learning, uh, work, or research. And I think that 
uh, lack of understanding about how people use OER um, sort of prevents us uh, from creating an ecosystem where we can learn both uh, learn from both OER providers and OER uh, users. Another challenge uh, that I'm seeing is that um, is people. Uh, so before coming to the United States, I was an instructional designer at the Hokkaido University, um, and I was um, sort of the person who um, um, who introduced this idea of open education to faculty and students. I was the person to uh, help faculty find the right resources that they wanted to look at. I was the person to uh, help them understand the, the, some of the in, important aspects of OER, like Creative Commons license. Um, but without people like us, they wouldn't be able to um, encounter this idea of open education. They wouldn't be able to find the appropriate resources that they wanted to look at, and they won't be able to um, have a clear understanding of Creative Commons licenses um, that they would need to know in order to um, use open educational resources for their teaching and learning. Um, and moving on to the last point, uh, the OER global uh, community. And I personally think that um, I was very lucky. So when I was when I got interested in this idea, uh, I was at, I was twenty years old, and at that time there were um, almost no, uh, especially young people who were interested in um, this movement. So it was very natural for me to reach out to the people outside of Japan to discuss issues around uh, open education and talk about my opinions uh, towards what's happening. Um, both in Japan and both in other countries. Um, and I really appreciate this global network. And I got to meet a lot of uh, friends that I, friends that I um, respect. I got to um, um, see a lot of interesting projects happening um, in different countries. And I was able to attend a lot of interesting um, conferences um, in different parts of the world. So I, I think it's definitely um, important to feel that um, we are part of this global community. But at the same time, I'm feeling that um, you know, we, we have been making transition from the phase where we um, created a lot of materials and uploaded those materials on the web to the phase where we are trying to uh, use those materials for our teaching and learning purposes. And I think that latter uh, phase where we are all in right now involves a lot of um, contextual, contextual, like local factors, like cultural issues, uh, social issues, organizational issues, uh, political issues. Sometimes, um, and lessons, uh, lessons learned, lessons learned from um, you know one single uh, local context and cannot be easily applied to another context. For example, I know a lot of interesting uh, projects happening in the United States, but I don't believe that you know many of these projects can be easily applied to the, for example, you know uh, Japanese higher education system. Those two countries just have a lot of differences in terms of education system, um, cultural values, how people think about the university education, um, how university faculty um, see uh, the teaching in classrooms. So um, while I really think that um, the global community and being in, the, in this global community is important, um, I also uh, think that I also strongly believe that you know having a regional uh, partnerships or the strong community um, around us uh, like for example in the case of Japan I, I think that we need to meet a lot of uh, people from uh, you know South Korea China other Asian countries who share a similar context and a similar interest um, in this movement of open education and then I think that having a having strong partnerships or networks uh, within each region or even smaller um, scale uh, will be the key uh, for the next five or 10 uh, years of this movement. My name is Jessica Stevens. I am a PhD candidate at the Queensland University of Technology. I'm a researcher and I'm part of Creative Commons Australia. Today I've been asked to talk to you about three things. First, the state of open textbooks in Australia. Second, the challenges we face. And third, the OER global community. Starting with the first point, 
The state of open textbooks in Australia varies between the states and territories, but in general it's gaining the most momentum in higher education institutions such as universities. There have been a couple of developments um, at the institutional level which I'll go through. So from the institution and academic perspective, a number of individual institutions have started their own open textbook projects or initiatives or pilot programs. The Australian National University, ANU, commenced an initiative in 2013 under their university press. It, was known, it is known as the ANU eText. This imprint is an open access option for academics to make their textbooks freely available online in digital format. Um, they allow for PDF, EPUB and Mobi formats and they are downloadable and able to be read online for free. In 2015, the University of Southern Queensland developed an open textbook initiative to encourage academics to think outside the traditional modes and to look at cheaper, cost-efficient and more friendly ways to publish their content online. Through the initiative, academics can receive funding to make their open textbook um, and since the initiative commenced, a number of open textbook projects have been commenced at the university. Similarly, the University of Sydney is undertaking a pilot project which aims to publish an open textbook to support a discipline, either an undergraduate or postgraduate course, which is currently taught at the university. They are taking submissions now for open textbook projects and are looking to commence creating the textbook in early 2018. Other universities around Australia are creating open textbooks on an ad hoc basis. This is generally driven by a particular academic or group of academics who are wanting to make their content available online for free. At the Queensland University of Technology, my university, we are currently making an open intellectual property law textbook for undergraduate students. We will also be supplementing this textbook with public facing open content on intellectual property law. This leads to our main concern at the university to make things accessible, not just for students, but also the general public, and they will all be made available completely open access online. These are just some of the projects and initiatives occurring in Australia. One of the things Australia does have a wealth of is passionate and intelligent people who are wanting to drive the open textbook movement. So that leads me to talk about, in 2016, a project team called Open Ed Oz, funded by the Department of Education and Training, released a research report, um, which is called Students, Universities and Open Education. In this report, they documented a number of things occurring in the open education space, including making recommendations for the future of open ed. One specifically was a roadmap which spoke of how we could implement open textbooks across Australia. Um, as I said, this is a movement which is gaining momentum, but there is still lots of work to be done. And this leads to point number two, some of the challenges we face. One of the primary challenges we face is that a lot of people in this movement in Australia are working in silos or within their universities. We have not yet been able to bridge the gap between um, individuals and organisations working collaboratively and collectively to progress this movement. Um, that's something that I'm really interested in doing in my role in Creative Commons, and I'm hoping that I will be able to bring together people to work on these shared common goals. The second challenge we face in Australia is with respect to funding. Um, and I would say this is probably an issue that most um, organisations who are trying to get initiatives like this off the ground face. In Australia, we currently lack stable, sufficient government support to fund open textbooks. We also do not have a wealth of big philanthropic funding going into these sorts of projects. Much of the projects and initiatives are funded by the institutions themselves and sometimes individual academic grants. Um, and that makes it difficult to be able to determine the sustainability um, of these sorts of um, funding projects. The third question is whether or not I feel like um, I'm part of a global OER community and whether or not Australia feels like they're part of the global OER community. As a member of Creative Commons Australia, I feel personally that I am involved in the global community. I feel like I'm very lucky because I, through my work, I've been able to engage with various open advocacy groups, um, such as um, I attended Sparks OpenCon, I attended the Creative Commons Summit, and most recently I attended Open Ed 2017. I'm also part of the Creative Commons Open Ed platform, um, which does bring together people from all around the world to talk about these issues. Through these networks, I'm kept up to date with what's happening globally, and I'm supported by people from all around the world. And whilst I feel like I'm personally involved in the global community, I feel like some of the advocates in Australia may not have that same support. Um, and this is one thing in my role in Creative Commons I'm really trying to overcome. 
I want to create an Australian community who is linked in and engaged together for domestic issues, but also feel like they're part of the global discussion. I recently spoke to one of my colleagues at the University of Southern Queensland, who is doing wonderful work in Open, and he's also creating um, an Australian special interest group in Open. I'm excited to join this group, but I'm even more excited to be able to link this group into some of these global communities so that we can share the benefits and learn from each other. Thank you so much for your time today, and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you. Goodbye. Bonjour, je suis Thomas Hervé Mouankoudou, originaire du Cameroun, donc de l'Afrique francophone. Initialement, je suis professeur au secondaire des sciences de la vie et de la terre. J'ai passé environ deux ans à Québec City, à l'Université Laval, pour faire mon PhD en information et en communication. Je ne l'ai pas encore terminé, mais je suis de retour au Cameroun où je suis également membre euh, d'une grande association d'enseignants de biologie qui essaye de faire des ressources éducatives libres, des pratiques vraiment innovantes dans leur métier euh, d'enseignant. Cependant, euh, la situation n'est toujours pas euh, facile. Je vais euh, agenter, euh, agencer mon propos en trois grandes parties. La première partie, je vais vous parler de l'état euh, des Open Textbooks au Cameroun. En deuxième partie, je vais euh, vous parler des différents challenges auxquels nous faisons face. Et puis finalement, je vais vous dire ce qui a été fait ou bien ce que euh, nous faisons. Euh, merci. En tant qu'enseignant de biologie ou enseignant de sciences de la vie et de la terre, je suis à mesure de vous dire que les open textbooks au Cameroun ne sont pas une réalité. Ce n'est pas quelque chose de très utilisé. Ce n'est pas utilisé dans notre système scolaire. Donc, s'il fallait parler de la situation des open textbooks au Cameroun, je dirais qu'elle est encore, elle est quasi inexistante, ou mieux, elle est embryonnaire, parce qu'il y a des initiatives privées, des initiatives, des groupes particuliers qui essayent de les intégrer, mais ça reste de façon, euh, de, de, de façon privée, de façon personnelle, parce que l'État n'a pas encore endossé euh, cette réalité ou bien cette euh, option dans sa façon de faire, dans la production des manuels scolaires ou bien dans le programme officiel en vigueur au Cameroun. Peut-être, mais je ne suis pas sûr, mais au niveau africain, il existe des politiques qui, quelquefois, évoquent les ressources éducatives libres. Mais, à ma connaissance, et particulièrement en Afrique francophone, je ne connais pas d'État africain qui utilise les open textbooks dans leur programme scolaire. Il ne s'agit que des initiatives privées de certaines associations comme la nôtre qui essaye d'impulser euh, le mouvement d'open textbooks à partir de certains angles, à partir de certaines euh, disciplines. Donc, concrètement, euh, l'état d'open textbooks au Cameroun est encore, et en Afrique francophone, est encore euh, embryonnaire. Merci. En 2007, j'ai été affecté en tant qu'enseignant de sciences de la vie et de la terre dans une partie euh, très enclavée, enclavée du Cameroun, à l'extrême nord du Cameroun. Je devais enseigner de la biologie là-bas. Et je me suis retrouvé dans cet environnement face à des élèves. Et moi-même, en tant qu'enseignant, on n'avait aucune ressource matérielle. On n'avait pas de livres, on n'avait pas d'électricité dans l'établissement. Il n'y avait pas de laboratoire. Mais je devais enseigner la biologie euh, en ce moment-là. Heureusement, jeune étudiant sorti de l'école, j'avais mon ordinateur portable. C'est à ce moment que j'ai commencé à m'intéresser à l'utilisation de mon ordinateur, à l'utilisation de la technologie, à euh, l'enseignement de la biologie. Et ce qui se passe donc, c'est que le premier challenge auquel j'ai dû faire face, c'était le problème d'énergie. Parce que moi, j'avais un ordinateur 
mais je n'avais toujours pas euh, je n'avais toujours pas je n'avais pas d'énergie à l'école pour brancher mes ordinateurs je n'avais pas d'énergie à l'école donc il fallait se déplacer des, des heures et des heures pour trouver un groupe électrogène et pouvoir euh, euh, charger mon ordinateur portable deuxièmement moi, j'avais un ordinateur en tant qu'enseignant, mais mes élèves et beaucoup d'autres de mes collègues n'avaient pas d'ordinateur euh, euh, ni de tablette. Et encore moins, la connexion Internet était euh, tout un luxe. Donc, pour dire par rapport aux <coughs> problèmes auxquels je fais face ou bien nous faisons face en tant qu'enseignant, sont de premier ordre des problèmes d'équipement, des problèmes d'accès à l'énergie. Au niveau euh, du Cameroun, ça, c'est des problèmes vraiment basiques qui n'existent pas dans les régions du Nord, mais nous avons euh, ces problèmes-là. Deuxièmement, il existe aussi un problème, un challenge politique, parce que les systèmes scolaires sont faits de façon à ce qu'il y ait un programme préétabli et que nous devons suivre en rigueur. À ce moment, donc, ce qui se passe, c'est que le programme prévoit l'utilisation de certains manuels scolaires qui sont des livres physiques que l'enseignant et l'élève doivent s'acheter pour pouvoir faire euh, le cours. Mais ces livres-là, quelquefois, sont peu accessibles aux populations. Certains parents ne peuvent pas acheter ces livres-là à, à ces élèves. Ce qui fait que la plupart du temps, beaucoup d'élèves n'ont pas de manuel scolaire à ce moment-là. Ils n'ont pas de manuel scolaire pour suivre les cours. C'est pourquoi... Euh, les ressources éducatives et libres et particulièrement les open textbooks seraient, sont une bonne solution pour nous. Mais le problème, c'est que nos politiques, notre politique éducative n'est pas consciente ou bien n'a pas encore intégré la notion d'open textbook euh, dans, euh, dans le programme en vigueur. Ce qui fait que ce n'est pas reconnu. Même si vous le faites, ce n'est pas reconnu toujours comme quelque chose d'utile ou bien le livre n'est pas reconnu officiellement. C'est un véritable problème, c'est un frein. De, euh, le troisième challenge est de l'ordre de euh, la fracture en termes de littératie numérique. Parce que beaucoup, beaucoup d'enseignants de, et d'élèves n'ont pas cette capacité à utiliser les outils du numérique pour... Euh, faire leur cours, pour dispenser, pour diffuser leur cours. La connexion Internet, aujourd'hui, c'est mieux parce qu'on a des téléphones et on peut se connecter avec nos cartes SIM. Mais beaucoup utilisent euh, cette connexion Internet pour les réseaux sociaux et autres choses, et, non, et rarement pour euh, des euh, causes éducatives. Oui, euh, je me suis membre de la grande communauté Open Educational Resources. Euh, C'est pourquoi euh, cela a beaucoup impacté dans ma façon de voir, ma façon de concevoir l'éducation et ma volonté de changer les choses à partir du contexte euh, camerounais. Euh, comme vous le voyez déjà, en 2015, j'avais organisé euh, ce séminaire sur euh, l'intégration des ressources éducatives libres dans l'enseignement euh, au Cameroun. Il était question pour nous d'élaborer une euh, feuille de route qui allait nous conduire à, à l'intégration pour accompagner euh, euh, les politiques. Euh, cependant, on n'avait pas été, euh, le gouvernement ou bien nos politiques n'ont pas pris en compte euh, ce qu'on leur proposait. C'est l'un des challenges que je citais plus haut à savoir le manque de l'adhésion des politiques dans l'intégration des euh, ressources éducatives libres. Et cependant, c'est bien d'utiliser des ressources éducatives libres, mais c'est encore plus intéressant de produire ces ressources éducatives libres à partir du milieu, c'est-à-dire au lieu de, 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 ployer sous, de, 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 de tomber sous le poids de toutes ces ressources qui sont disponibles sur Internet et qui viennent de la plupart du Nord. Il est question d'utiliser les ressources à partir de, nos, euh, de notre contexte, d'utiliser nos ressources, nos enseignants et tout ça pour produire euh, des ressources comme les Open Textbooks. Et à ce moment, c'est pourquoi 
j'avais créé euh, ce groupe appelé la Fabrique des ressources éducatives libres, hein, qui était euh, chargé euh, de produire des ressources éducatives, ou bien qui est chargé de produire des ressources éducatives libres à partir euh, de l'intérieur, à partir de l'Afrique. La, Et ce que nous avons fait de bien avec ce que j'ai beaucoup apprécié, la plateforme Pressbook qui nous a aidé à produire des manuels scolaires. Parce qu'avec Pressbook, nous avons pu produire nous-mêmes nos livres que nous avons mis euh, en ligne. On vous verrez des sciences en de sciences de la vie et de la terre. Donc, nous avons produit des manuels de, en sciences de la vie et de la terre, en physique et en chimie. Euh, comme vous voyez, vous voyez, ce sont des manuels scolaires euh, faits par des enseignants respectueux des problèmes officiels, adaptés au contexte africain, accessibles gratuitement, PDF et ouverts aux commentaires. Mmh, ces manuels-là. Et j'ai utilisé la, place, euh, la, la plateforme Pressbook euh, pour faire. Donc, vous avez les différents cours disponibles ici, en sein de la vie de la Terre. Vous n'avez qu'à cliquer sur un de ces cours pour euh, le faire. Et là, par exemple, c'est un cours, c'est un chapitre sur... Euh, euh, les mécanismes fondamentaux de la révolution sexuée et tout le monde a accès à ce cours dans, euh, sur internet j'utilise ça, c'est la plateforme Pressbook dont le cours est disponible là, vous pouvez euh, aller plus loin, le cours est là les chapitres sont là, tout le monde peut accéder tout le monde peut accéder à ce cours euh, sans problème, c'est ce qui est euh, très bien et <coughs> Comme vous le verrez, la plateforme est fréquentée. Je reçois beaucoup de commentaires, des gens qui trouvent que c'est génial, hein? des, des gens qui euh, ont besoin de téléchargement parce qu'on ne peut pas télécharger euh, ici, là. Des gens qui adorent des, 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 des messages d'encouragement de, et, et des gens qui demandent à télécharger et tout. Vraiment, c'est quelque chose de, de très intéressant. Bien sûr, j'ai besoin de... Nous avons besoin de... Parce que c'est une association qui travaille. Mais saisir tous ces cours-là, ou bien regarder, faire les corrections sur Facebook, ce n'est pas du tout évident. Ce n'est pas du tout évident. Je, je supportais tout ça avec mes propres moyens. Euh, si je pouvais avoir un appui... Fabrel pouvait avoir un appui pour continuer ce travail-là et engager plus d'enseignants à produire des manuels, à travailler, à intégrer des ressources dans euh, euh, Pressbook, ça serait très bien. Parce que l'idée, rendez-vous compte, était de faire connecter plusieurs enseignants situés partout au Cameroun hein, et les faire intervenir dans le cours sans problème, c'est-à-dire qu'il soit dans une région, dans l'autre, qui puisse intervenir dans le cours euh, en commentant. Cependant, beaucoup n'ont pas de moyens, beaucoup n'ont pas le temps. Il faut payer ceci, il faut assurer. Et puis, avec la plateforme Pressbook aussi, euh, nous sommes limités à un certain moment parce que on a besoin de plus d'espace, besoin de plus d'espace pour mettre les, les, les images, les chemins, bien des petites vidéos, nous n'avons pas cet espace-là, ça pourrait être quelque chose de très bien. Si je pouvais avoir ce soutien-là, si Fabrel pouvait avoir ce soutien-là, afin de présenter euh, quelque chose de, de faisable à nos différents gouvernements, euh, ça serait quelque chose de bien, parce que je suis certain qu'avec un cas pareil, un exemple comme Fabrel, qui marche très bien, euh, les gouvernements seront euh, pourront prendre cette initiative-là et l'adopter dans les politiques pour, dans le cadre des, euh, des, des, des open textbooks, si on le veut bien. Donc, de façon globale, c'est ce que j'avais à dire. Et... The state of OER is in our jurisdiction, so I'll specifically talk about the K-12 space, which we call R12 in South Africa. We have had some spectacular successes, but not built on solid policy um, processes or fundamentally sound kind of sustainability models. So when I say we've had some great successes, we've produced grade 4 to 12 science content, um, textbooks and workbooks, which have been reviewed 
uh, by the National Ministry of Education, our Department of Basic Education, they've printed it for the whole country. So every single school in South Africa, 100% of government schools, have received print hard copy um, titles that are available under an open license. Um, we've been pragmatic. The government print copies carry a CC BY ND license, and online you can get all of that content CC BY, but without the government logo. Just trying to deal with the fact that the government was uncertain about what it would mean to advocate changing content, especially in a context like South Africa, where we've got massive disparities from the past, and still, a, specifically in math and science, a teaching force that is largely underqualified and under-supported to, to deliver quality learning in the classrooms, for all sorts of reasons. The reason I say that um, those are our spectacular successes, but that wasn't built on a systematic policy around openly licensed materials. There's no real sustainability models for OERs at large in the country. So while we've had those successes, the OER movement in K-12 has basically stalled at that point. So we don't have a lot of new um, openly licensed materials. Nobody knows how to fund it. Um, the government can't easily fund it because of their processes and their policies don't really cater for it. And that's why one of the reasons that civil education we spent most of our time actually building um, an online software as a service offering which, which complements our math and science books, um, which is something that we take to market to schools, to individuals, and we work with uh, funders a lot. So we're actually a for-profit entity producing openly licensed materials. If you take OERs into the classroom um, and you talk to teachers about it, the, um, the fundamentals of the value that the open license adds are not really well understood. Um, they don't know a lot about copyright law. They don't see how copyright law really, um, or its use by traditional publishers can constrain them. They just have concerns about whether they're going to be in trouble for remixing resources, copying resources, etc. Um, so they don't like to share resources. Then there's the technical barriers. So, so what if you've got openly licensed content? If you've got a print book in the classroom, who cares if it's under an open license? Um, what technical format, what tools do you provide that allow them to edit it, adapt it, contextualize it to their specific needs? So there's a lot of challenges and that's only at the high end of the market um, where there's good technology penetration and the teachers are relatively um, tech savvy. Um, so that's kind of the state of OERs in our school sector. One needs to remember that in South Africa, the school sector is under massive pressure. So the education system is by and large failing the country. So we perform very poorly on international benchmarks. Uh, we don't have, we have, we're struggling with continuous professional development for teachers. Um, you know, many of our schools are considered dysfunctional by some measure. It's not politically correct to talk about that, but the fact of the matter is there are schools without electricity, running water, there are not safe structures for children to be in, their teachers are poorly trained, they're under-resourced, they're under-supported, they're in deep rural areas. There's massive, massive problems in the, in the South African education system. So OERs are definitely a useful thing. They can be leveraged for cost saving, one, but that's not their primary benefit, to adapt the material, um, change it, etc., to specific needs. I think that's where the real learning benefit could come from, especially when we're dealing with a huge variety of contexts, this massive disparity from a rural school to a high-end private school where every, every student will have a tablet, an iPad, high-end Samsung Galaxy, something like that, or a laptop. And we have, we have both ends of the spectrum very well represented in South Africa, <clears throat> and then obviously the, all the schools in between. So, so the challenges around OER um, in South Africa really, um, the, so we figured out how to produce OERs in a very collaborative way, hybrid model between volunteers working together and paid authors who drive the process, manage the process. So we feel like we've got that down, we produce them in print PDF, web PDF, uh, HTML4 version for low-end phones and with uh, poor browsers, HTML5 version for the responsive web, which we can easily package as an EPUB. So that's, that's straightforward. We can do all of that. Um, but after that, it's all about the set, helping government set up good policy that allows OERs to become part of the mainstream. Um, we need that. And then there's the barriers around editing. The, so we still have to produce for the school space an editing platform where teachers can truly adapt content easily in a way that meets their needs. Um, there are technically elegant ways to 
produce openly licensed content so that it's easily transformable. Uh, teachers aren't ideal, ideally suited or trained to produce or edit content in those formats typically. And the tools that they use are, can be quite proprietary, very difficult to adapt, etc. This so versioning issues, all sorts of things. So we've got a lot of a lot of challenges around that. But if we could do one thing, it would be to figure out a way for government procurement to support the production of openly licensed materials and enable teachers to adapt those materials. Do we feel like we're part of the international community? So we're not integrated, uh, a very integral part of that community for sure. So I mean, we, we're, I think, often invited to participate in workshops in the United States, but I think the OER movement currently um, is, is not very um, focused on Africa. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in Africa. I also find that the open movement in the US, it's changing now, but you know, we're, I've been at this for 15 years, really started out focused on college and we're focused in the school space. So it's quite, a, it's quite different. And school is much more regulated than college. Typically your uh, processes for vetting, etc., are quite different. Who's gonna make the decision to use the content? The typical qualifications of the person making those decisions is quite different. Um, I know that certainly in, in first world countries the school system is also very complicated, at, um, so in K-12, so adoption is tricky. And funding models for OERs, something everyone I think is, is trying to um, solve. And I think we're leaning towards kind of globally value-added services, continuous professional development. So the OERs are fundamental to improving teaching. But there's a lot of things we can do, um, given that we understand the teaching process, we understand the adaptation process, and we typically understand the technology much better to support um, the process of delivering open education, built on open educational resources in a much more, much more effective way. So I think we, we, we feel quite isolated. There isn't a, a kind of a vibrant open educational resources community in South Africa and we're just far away so a lot of travel to get to the United States you spend 25 hours on a plane um, and the a lot of the funding goes into projects that are in very different contexts to uh, the context we're working in so even if we're present at events there is still quite a difference between the types of challenges we have to worry about and the types of challenges that a lot of open educational resources um, projects are grappling with um, Kind of internationally. <clears throat> so we're relatively well aware of what's happening, but I don't feel like we're an integral part of it. And I don't see an easy way to, for us to become a more integral part of the, the kind of international uh, open educational resources movement, just because of the, the very, very different contexts. I think that there's a, a real future for OERs in Africa. I think that it's, it's, going, it's starting to take off. It'll, again, similar to the argument for college in the United States, will be a lot about cost saving. Um, but being able to transform content easily between formats and the variety of devices and how mobile phone penetration is so high in Africa, but a lot of other infrastructure is lacking. There are opportunities there. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for OERs to develop in Africa. And we actually need to build our own vibrant community and come up with our own solutions. Um, so and riff on what's happening elsewhere, but come up with innovative and cool ideas that everybody else wants to copy and riff on as well. Hello friends from the Rebus Foundation. It's a big pleasure to be connecting with you to talk about open textbooks and openness in education. Um, I want to thank Liz for this invitation and, and considering uh, contributing to uh, this uh, fabulous community that Rebus is, is it's building. So I want to talk about some uh, the state of art of openness in, in higher education. Um, I must say that in Chile we've been we have a lot of unawareness related to openness and and we do need to do a lot of advocacy work. Um, and I think that the big challenge around raising awareness and advocacy is that we need to tackle, we need to connect the challenges that higher education institutions face today. Um, there's a big challenge, for example, related to the public service role of, of higher education institutions, you know, out of, out of the institution engagement. Um, 
and and I think um, the institutions need to show what they do and and I think resource open resources can be a very powerful marketing uh, instrument so they can show what the processes are what what's the what are the, the specific trends that in where these institutions are very competitive so I think that can be a, a, a big issue for them but I think the main challenges are if the the institutions face today are first of all the high dropout in first and second years in many institutions that climbs up to 40 45 percent of of a dropout so institutions need to retain those uh, students I think resources can play a role around that supporting better academic performance so they can stop this dropout something very uh, similar I think that's the second issue is related to degree completion um, our students really take a long time to, to get their degrees and um, I think resources can, can also back up uh, strategies where they can uh, foster degree completion. And there's the, uh, another uh, issue related to gratuity. This is a public policy with, where there's uh, a context of uh, free of charge. Um, and uh, what ha that has mean, meant is that uh, a different type of students have come to the universities, a students that come from a very depressed or diminished social economic context so they have a, a very low cultural context um, where they come from so they lack a lot of academic skills and they need more support and I think resources can really play a big role there. Another key issue that higher institutions face today is related to the redefining the, the role of libraries um, what kind of a services they can be providing uh, in this uh, uh, knowledge era so um, so I think that's a that's a, uh, can be a big deal for stakeholders and I think we also need to be pushing to tackle these challenges um, having the promise of OER in open textbooks related to the promise of innovation in learning and teaching. I think that's kind of the, the key thing that really uh, connects OER to the challenge that the higher education institutions face today. So student-centered learning experiences, learning by doing, hands-on, or learning uh, by projects and renewable assignments, those kinds of innovations, they can really uh, make sense uh, building a, a new role for students and teachers uh, and having a resource driven support, learning support for their educational experience. And uh, I think the good news is that, that we have a very strong evidence today that show that research <clears throat> shows that open textbooks are at least the same or better than proprietary materials. So um, in that sense I want to highlight the R OER for D uh, project research for open educational resources for development uh, uh, initiative uh, 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 research agenda led by the Uni University of Cape Town in South Africa and funded by the IDRC in Canada and they're starting to to deliver different studies and uh, there's one from Chile um, sub project 9 and uh, very very proud uh, that this will be published next uh, next year so there we developed in that project we developed three textbooks which uh, was my first approach and from that uh, I am working around uh, an open textbook initiative in the University of the Catholic University of Valparaíso the main port here in Chile this is a US embassy funded project and what we will be doing is trying to reply the 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 open textbook network project from the University of Minnesota. So um, in that we have a lot of challenges related to the methodologies of producing textbook. We'll be, we will be working on two trends. First of all, translation as well as authoring. So uh, we have to um, think about how to build those uh, textbooks and we need to choose the, the, the technical infrastructure we'll, that we'll, we'll be setting for this production 
as well for the transference and the faculty adoption and the sustainability of the textbooks. I think that's a very key issue, the sustainability issue. We did have a, a, a very interesting project in Latin America called the Latin Project, funded by the European Commission. But as funding ended, the, the, uh, the project also stopped. So I think uh, we need to tackle this sustainability, sustainability issue so our work can really project itself to the future. We will be working around two textbooks um, as, as, as is expected results of this project. This is a one-year project, a short one, the first building block uh, for uh, our initiative. And we will be working around English learning as well as digital citizenship uh, education. I think that's a big trend, especially for international collaboration, because we all share global citizenship challenges or sustainable development goals, I think is very connected to this. So we will be implementing these textbooks in formal courses in the university. So we will try to have a sense of what the impact and effect of this. So I'm over time, um, but uh, I'm very attentive uh, for the further discussion uh, this uh, video might take. So please count on my disposal for following activities. And thank you once again. Bye-bye from Santiago, Chile. Thank you so much to our wonderful guests this month for sharing their work. Uh, we're really looking forward to speaking with them more on the forum and we hope that you will join us. Please come armed with any questions you might have. Um, and we also welcome questions in whatever language you're most comfortable speaking in. Uh, we think there's gonna be a bit of Google Translate involved. Um, we're really looking forward to continuing this discussion for the rest of this week and beyond. Thank you again for joining us.